Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining today for today's AIA approved course, how to design a safe and compliant automated vehicular gate system. My name is Bo, I'm with Ace Lab. We're helping out with hosting today's event. Um, I'm gonna give a very quick intro, take care of a few housekeeping items and then pass it over to my colleague Armand for a very uh, quick debrief on Ace Lab and how we work with architects. That'll be a few minutes. And after about five minutes, we'll go ahead and get started with today's CEU approved event. All right, so as I mentioned, um, Ace Lab is helping out with hosting today's event. Um, anyone who registered automatically had an Ace Lab account made for them. It's totally free to use. So feel free to head over to Ace Lab uh, during or after today's webinar to check out everything we've got going on there. Today, I just wanna show you one thing, which is if you are looking to get in touch with the presenters of today's course after today's event, um, you can use this search bar at the top to type in the name of any manufacturer, including high security, and head over to their pages on Ace Lab. You can request more information directly through the site. So this is a great place to come to connect with them, learn a little bit more about their brand and about their products. Um, all right. So other than that, I just want to let everyone know that um, we did collect AIA numbers upon registration. I'm also going to send out a form throughout today's webinar. So if you forgot to give your AIA number or you would like to specify a certificate request, you can fill out that form. Um, we'll have a record of that. Please allow for some time for the credits to show up into your account, um, but those will be reported directly to AIA. Um, and then there's also going to be time for Q&A, so please feel free to submit questions to the Q&A box throughout today's webinar, and if we don't get to your question, we'll have a record of it so we can follow up after today's event. All right, with that, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Armand. He's going to give a quick little intro about Ace Lab and how we work with architects, so if you're interested in learning more about that, um, you can connect with us after today's webinar, and then we'll go ahead and get started with today's AIA-approved course from High Security. Perfect. Thanks so much, Bo. Um, hi, all. Uh, my name is Armand. I'm Ace Labs director, director of Architectural Partnerships, and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is work very directly with architecture firms to answer uh, not only their material research questions, but also connect them with vendors um, to meet their design intent for their projects. And so uh, what I wanted to share with you today is our product concierge program, which is a program that I run um, to help architects on a day-to-day -day basis um, and set up regular check-ins to both build up their firm library and also do this material research. I myself am a licensed architect here in New York City and I've worked across uh, a bunch of different projects, uh, both in the commercial and residential worlds. Um, so I think it's really helpful to kind of give you an example of what this really looks like. Um, and so what we really do is some of that material research. We also help build that custom office wide firm library through our Ace Lab platform. And then as part of that, we'll also identify opportunities to improve your library through building product workshops and give you proactive education. So one type of question that I got just this past week uh, around material research uh, was a firm looking for uh, modular ceiling products that both hit their need for integrated lighting solutions and also fire resistance. And so we were able to suggest two uh, different modular products, one from USG, which is a large manufacturer in the space, and another from Rockfon. Rockfon in particular, having a product called Mono that uh, not only had the integrated lighting, but was also a fire resistant product uh, that was able to meet that drop ceiling solution that they were looking for. And if we were to come to qu up with questions around parking and security in those ways, we can also connect you with a company like Hyper Security, who's here on, um, on this call today. And so that's what we're able to help with, draw that connection, uh, make sure we're identifying the right design and, uh, needs for you. And so, uh, We'll drop a Zoom survey for you to respond to uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the program and how we work very directly with architects through bi-weekly check-ins. Um, respond to that survey. We'll talk about your current library and what you're currently expecting in your projects. And from that point forward, we'll start helping you improve the library and also answer questions for your project. So uh, feel free to drop me a message, email me, answer the survey. Um, I'm always available. But uh, now back to you, Bo and Brad. Thanks so much for the time. Awesome. Right. Thanks so much, Arman. All right, Brad, it's over to you. Um, thank you so much for joining today and for presenting today's course. Um, yeah, feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. All right. Thanks, guys. Get my screen shared here. Second. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, so welcome to how to design a safe, compliant, automated gate system. 
Uh, so I'm with high security gate operators. We're a division of NICE North America. Uh, we're a worldwide recognized industry leader uh, in, for automated vehicular access. So my role with high security is to work with specifiers, architects, engineers, consultants uh, in the design phase uh, in supporting the specification process. So first of all, I wanna introduce you to the specification team. Um, we're here to help you in the design stage with access control point design, uh, UL ASTM safety guidelines, uh, specification review, and general perimeter security design consultation. So I handle the Western region. Uh, David Wharton uh, covers the Eastern region. We got Nikki Dental over there in the Central region. And then Wool covers all international business. So give us a call and, or send us an email. We've got a current project that needs automated gate systems. This is an AIA accredited course. It offers an HSW health safety welfare credit. Uh, so those with an AIA number will get that credit. Um, we'll give you a, a QR code at the end that you can scan with your phone and go to a form to fill out to get your certificate sent off to you. Uh, and then we'll also register uh, you with AIA for your a HSW credit. So this presentation is designed to train architects, engineers, and installers and in best practices for a safe and compliant automated gate system. You'll learn how to identify non-compliant gate systems, how to design for compliance with UL and ASTM safety standards, and where to search for additional resources about the standards. So there's a lot of information here. I uh, don't expect you guys to retain all of it. Uh, certainly, uh, we are your best resource, so give us a call if you have any questions about compliance with your project. So anytime you automate a vehicular access point, uh, UL325 and ASTM F2200 safety standards come into play. Uh, so underwriter laboratories, they generate the UL325 standard for gate operators specifically, whereas ASTM uh, generates the F2200 standard that governs the construction of the gate and how all the parts and pieces are in integrated together, such that you're not uh, creating pinch points and hazards. So if you're familiar with the standard, you might know that uh, back in uh, 2018, there were a few changes made to it. Um, this is basically it. Uh, the number two bullet there pretty much encapsulates the standard. Uh, it says here that it requires two independent means of monitored entrapment protection for each direction of travel, both open and close, but one direction only for close, uh, which is closed for the swing gates and lesser than the entrapment zone that exists in the open direction. So we're gonna get into that in a little bit. But we're also required to uh, define all entrapment zones for all types of gates. Uh, it requires the manufacturer to list compatible approved devices, which we're gonna send you a uh, follow-up email with that list. It requires the manufacturer to show entrapment zones and tell where and how to protect those, and also disallows the use of jumpers and resistors uh, to defeat monitoring, which some of the various installers might try to do. You'll hear from some that UL and ASTM standards are voluntary and don't carry the force of law, but nothing really could be further from the truth. Um, Nevada you know, became the first state uh, to embrace them back in 01, uh, followed by Louisiana and Florida. By 2014, we had more than 50% of the states and municipalities were including them in their building codes. You'll find that OSHA includes it at the federal level, and you'll also find this standard listed in the International Building Code, the IBC. So a moving gate can cause serious injury or death, unfortunately. DASMA doesn't pull any punches on this. Um, I'll give you a couple examples here. The one on the left, um, there's an unfortunate accident there. This is an HOA facility in Las Vegas. <clears throat> and uh, there's a couple of boys who would try to get in and out of the facility through this hole here in the fence. Laser pointer. They crawl through this space here. And uh, the, the boy's friend dropped his bike on the free exit loop, which automated the gate. And unfortunately, got him caught in here and squished and, squished and killed him. Uh, so that could have been pre uh, prevented if they brought this gap down to two and a quarter inches. You're going to hear that a lot throughout this presentation. But if that gap was in compliance, uh, would have been two and a quarter inches, then that would not have happened. The example on the right, uh, there was a 10-year-old boy that unfortunately lost his life on a slide gate, uh, there was improper follower protection. 
that slide gate became detached from the operator during operation and unfortunately fell over and hit him on the head. Another example, uh, there was a uh, janitor leaving work at the Dickey Stadium. He was able to reach through the gate panel and operate the gate with his arms through the gate panel. So there's two things here that were could have been prevented. Uh, the fact that he was able to reach through the, the gate panel uh, is something that we'll address here. Uh, and also the fact that he's able to actually reach the access control while reaching to the gate panel. So unfortunately he didn't make that either, so. An automated vehicular access point is more than just a, a, a gate. It's, it's really a full system, right? So the system includes a number of devices, multiple external and inherent traffic safety devices, um, you know, act, such as access control, the gate, the gate operator, you have locking mechanisms, you know, vehicle sensors, those kinds of things. So all these components, typically from different manufacturers, uh, need to work together seamlessly uh, to provide the required security and throughput, but more importantly, the safety, right? So safety is really your top priority here. So access control points, so they could be hazardous to people or, or definitely cause uh, damage to vehicles if they're designed without accurate, adequate safety uh, considerations. So as a specifier, you want to make sure that you're specifying proper equipment and safety devices you know, that will result in a safe installation. So again, safety really is the most important design consideration, uh, even for something uh, you know, like a nuclear power plant, an airport, something that's high security uh, to an environment. Um, safety definitely is one of your top priorities. Again, uh, UL325 governs the machine that moves the gate along with the entrapment protection devices. It also calls out the specific installation requirements like signage and placement of safety devices. UL listed operators are tested by an independent uh, laboratory such as ETL. Uh, they'll test the gate operator and the accessories and they'll certify it meets the UL325 uh, requirements. You'll notice the, the first bullet item there calls out UL 325 as a voluntary listing and labeling program. So while some manufacturers will bring a gate operator that's unlisted on mark to market, the liability on that particular equipment is pretty high. Um, so under most jurisdictions, if the site is inspected, you know, you'll have an installer or end user will be informed by, uh, by that inspector that it does not uh, meet uh, the requirements for UL 325 and oftentimes They'll either have to replace the operator completely or at least do whatever it takes to get it up to snuff. So your most reliable source for UL325 uh, standards is in the documentation. So if you look in the back of our documentation, that's gonna be the most up-to-date and current version of the UL325 standard. So you can find it there. Certainly give us a call if you have any questions on it. So we offer CSI formatted three-part spec language for all of our operators. Uh, this is an example of one here. UL 325 is called out uh, in here and it must be uh, listed by a nationally recognized laboratory. You also wanna call out the qualification of workers, making sure you have thoroughly trained and experienced workers performing this type of work. And it's important to require the installer has a minimum of three years experience installing similar equipment and has attended our factory training within the last three years. This is a really important part. Um, it's really important that you make sure you have a good quality trained installer doing this work. That's uh, gonna go a long ways towards a good installation and also a safe and compliant installation. Listed and marked are uh, key specification terms. So the term UL325 compliant, that could be you know, self-declared by any manufacturer attempting to bypass the standard, you know, without going through the, the lengthy and expensive process of having their machines third-party tested and, and marked by UL. So it's important for the specifier to specifically declare the specification uh, that the gate operator must be tested, listed, and marked by an independent tester testing laboratory. So you see the picture here is actually one of our operators with the ETL sticker. We use ETL as our third-party laboratory. Conforms to UL325 and also conforms to the Canadian CSA standard, which is their version of UL325 up north.
So UL defines their sites by four classes, four usage classes. They range from single family residential to restricted access and high security installations. So usage class one covers up to four single family residences. Because of the, the presence of children and general public in class one and two, slide gates must have a one foot per second or slower speed limit. So class one and two, is a speed limit of one foot per second on slide gates, whereas in three and four, it's unlimited. So you should class two covers any multifamily residential application in excess of four residences or a commercial site with general public access, such as the office park. Remember that, that the gate operator uh, is listed and marked to indicate what class of installation is suitable uh, gate operator should only be installed where the class uh, rating of a gate operator matches the class of the actual site. So if the gate will be used by general public or the public will be near uh, around the automated gate system, then that site is likely a class one or two. I get a lot of questions around this, you know, the, this confusion of, of are we in a class two or a class three? Do we need to uh, reduce our uh, speed limit on the slide gate to one foot per second or can we go faster? Um, so it's often a, a gray area, and that's something I can certainly help you guys out with. So if the public uh, will not use the gate or, or be near the gate, then it's either a class three or a class four. If it's off the beaten path, it's industrial in, by, in nature. Uh, if the people traversing this access point are trained users, meaning that they have credentials to get in and out of that facility, uh, it's likely a three, uh, or if it's a very high security environment, then it's likely a four. So class four is very restricted access. Uh, you know, restricted access includes applications as prisons, uh, airports, data centers, DOD sites. These are sites that, that must be monitored by either a guard or, or um, at the entrance or you know, closed circuit TV, that kind of thing. What you're seeing in the picture here is the United Nations uh, building. That's definitely a class four environment. Um, just to kind of give you an idea of what goes on here, you know, the, the sequence of, of operations here, the vehicle drives up, the swing gate goes open, lets the vehicle through, swing gate closes behind the vehicle. They stop in front of this barrier arm. Uh, the guy comes out with a mirror, does the check on the vehicle, gives the thumbs up, and the barrier arm goes up, lets the vehicle through. So that's definitely a, a class four type of environment. So this chart is actually listed in the UL325 documentation. Uh, it's kind of a, a helpful cheat sheet. Uh, it gives you an idea of what types of uh, safety devices are required. Remember we talked about the fact that it, it requires two independent means of monitored and trapped protection covering both open and closed direction. So knowing that if we're working with a slide gate, you come down and look at what types of safety devices are available to you. That's required by UL that the manufacturer builds into the operator what's called an inherent entrapment protection system or inherent entrapment sensor. A lot of times people refer to it as an IES system. So that inherent entrapment sensor is built into the operator. It's required by UL that we do that. And what that does essentially is it recognizes when it's hit an object, stops the gate, backs it up. We'll get a little bit more into that. So you have your inherent entrapment sensor built into the operator. So that's your first means of entrapment protection. And you're left to decide on your secondary means of entrapment protection. That's either a photo eye or a contact sensor, which is otherwise known as a gate edge. Uh, and so a combination of those uh, can be used to be compliant with the standard. If we're working with a swing gate, pretty much the same thing applies. Rather than the type A, we have the type C inherent force limiting clutch system um, that's basically uh, set to typically on a, on a swing gate, for instance, uh, that would be set at 40 pounds. Uh, so if 40 pounds uh, of force is applied to the gate, it's going to sort of clutch out and stop the, you know, pushing against whatever it's hit. And then you've got your type D. Uh, so Typically, you'll see this type D button utilized in a class four environment. So type D is a continuous pressure button. 
So uh, figure a guy uh, at a, a, in a guardhouse at a prison, uh, the gate operator has the um, type A, the inherent traffic sensor system built into it. And they have this, this type D button. They have line of sight either through uh, video or in person. So they can see that gate moving. So as they press the button, the gate moves, they let go of the button, the gate stops. So they have full control through that button, through the type D button. When it comes to inherent entrapment sensors, uh, they do operate a little differently depending on what type of gate operator you're working with. Uh, the one on the left is a hydraulic slide gate, the one on the right is electromechanical. A hydraulic slide gate will have built into it, uh, its IES inherent traffic sensor will be uh, a pressure sensor. So it's basically uh, looking for a spike in hydraulic pressure. Let's say that operator operates at 750 PSI normal operation. The installer might set that um, inherent traffic sensor like 175 to 200 PSI above that. Gate hits an object, sees a spike in the pressure, stops and backs up. Same end result on the electromechanical. Uh, the only difference is it's using a spike in current to solve the same problem. And then barrier arms again uh, have the type C rather than the type A. So they'll have basically a clutch system. Uh, this particular operator has a conical shaped um, interface point here um, that actually functions as its type C. Is an example of uh, both photo eyes and gate edges. So I typically recommend using through beam photo eyes rather than reflective. They're both available and, and certainly compliant with the standard. Uh, through beam photo eyes are gonna be a lot more reliable. They're not gonna be susceptible to sun or debris and that kind of thing. Uh, you do have to have power run across the lane. So you need power on both ends. So these, uh, these sensors are sending and receiving from both directions. Uh, whereas if you can't uh, run power across the lane, then you probably want to use a reflective style. Then your gate edges, those are typically five feet in length. These will typically go on a, on a slide gate. They'll go on the leading and trailing edge of the gate. Uh, and they uh, operate from one direction. So they, you know, once something hits the, the object here or hits the, uh, the rubber bumper, uh, it makes a connection to the circuit, tells the operator, I've hit something, stop and back up. So it's kind of like a, an elevator door would work uh, when you hit the bumper on the elevator door, stops and backs up. This is the list that will be sent out to you in email post this uh, presentation. So this is a list of uh, safety devices that have been tested uh, and approved by UL to work with our gate operators. So uh, most of these are things that we don't make. Uh, these are from other manufacturers, but we've gone through the process of running them through UL to be tested and approved for our operators. So in this example, um, so we talked about the fact that you need two independent means of entrapment protection covering both open and closed direction. In this particular example, you can see that they've utilized uh, photo eyes, one across the lane and another set on the back frame. So protecting both uh, closed and open direction. So photo eyes, uh, they're an alternative to edge sensors. Um, they have advantages and disadvantages. They're, they're non-contact sensor, which is their primary advantage. Uh, they detect instruction without having to hit an object, right? Uh, the primary disadvantage is um, that only the line of the photo beam is what's protecting. So uh, if a gate were to encounter an obstruction above or below that beam, that object would not be detected. The recommended uh, installation location for photo eyes, they're typically post matted like you see in this photo here. You'll typically have them about five inches off the face of the gate uh, and from 21 to 27 and a half inches off of grade. Another example here, uh, utilizing edges. So rather than photo eyes, we've got gate edges, uh, both on the leading and trailing edge of the gate here, covering both open and closed direction. And so that is compliant as well.
So again, on a, on a slide gate, you're typically going to have um, gate edges installed and leading and trailing edge. But you also want to be concerned about this area here. So the way the standard reads, uh, the, so let me put it this way. You you want to, to make sure that anything that is considered an entrapment zone is protected. And so their definition of an entrapment zone here would be if the gap between the gate and the guidepost is within 16 inches, but greater than two and a quarter inches, that's considered an entrapment zone. There's two options you have here. You could basically use some kind of a uh, material in here to bring that gap down to two and a quarter inches, or you could provide a wired gate edge uh, on the guidepost. So these are gonna be wireless out here. They'll have a uh, transmitter that's communicating with the receiver inside the operator. You don't have a wires dangling as they're going back and forth. Whereas this one would be wired, hardwired into the operator, run to a conduit up into the operator and uh, terminate on uh, the appropriate terminal on the, uh, the control board. Well, things to know about gate edges, um, obviously they have hit something to work. Uh, they use batteries, as I mentioned, they are uh, wireless in terms of how they operate. And so there are batteries in there. Those batteries are typically last about two years and need replacement. Uh, and the gate edge uh, often will need replacement at some point uh, because they are subject to climate wear, and that kind of thing. This is an example of a commercial class two site. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, they're utilizing the inherent traffic sensor for their, uh, their primary uh, safety device and their secondary safety device in this case is the photo eye. So a couple of things here we'll get into related to ASTM that this particular site has, but uh, we'll jump into that in a bit. This is a single family uh, class one environment. And so uh, on, the, on these two um, scenarios, uh, when it comes to the slide gate, you wanna make sure that you're installing or specifying a one foot per second operator. So in this case, uh, they've used the inherent traffic sensor with their primary device and gate edge for their secondary device, protecting both open and closed direction. All right, so having gone through all that, uh, you can see there's a number of ways to approach compliance with this. Um, so there can be a combination of photo eyes and gate edges. We recommend on slide gates to utilize photo eyes. Um, the reason we do that, a lot of the environments that we have these installed are industrial in nature, and they'll have a lot of uh, radio frequency traffic within that environment. It does tend to cause havoc with the wireless gate edges. Uh, so there's a lot of, of maintenance and, and tech support calls related to that. Uh, so we recommend utilizing photo eyes. So again, covering the lane and one on the back plane. So you've got a, you're covering the both the closed and the open direction of the photo eyes. And then if there's an entrapment zone that exists here, you want to make sure you're utilizing either uh, a wired gate edge wired into the operator or some material that's going to bring that gap down to two and a quarter inches. comes to swing gates, as I mentioned, the only uh, requirement is to protect the closed direction unless there is an entrapment zone in the open direction, which would mean when this gate is in the fully open position, if it's up against a fence line or a, a, a wall, if that gap between the fully open gate and the fence line is within 16 inches, you'll need a photo eye in this area. But if it's out in the open, it's okay. Uh, you wanna make sure you put a photo eye across the lane and then the other thing to mention on swing gates, uh, in terms of mounting it on a pilaster like this particular example, if the, the gap here between where it's mounted and the edge of the pilaster uh, is greater than, uh, than four inches, uh, but less than 16 inches, um, then the trap zone must, then that must be protected. Or you would, you would move this out and install it separately and differently. Water before operate uh, used to be part of the standard. It is no longer required. Uh, however, it does get installed in all the operators that go out the door. 
uh, it's definitely a good idea to have that. Uh, it certainly can be uh, defeated or, or uh, turned off if you're in an environment where that's annoying. So this uh, is probably the simplest thing, but probably the most important. Uh, if you know uh, an accident does tend to go to uh, to court, you know if there's a legal battle around some sort of an injury with the, with the gate system, first thing an attorney is going to point to is where there are warning signs. So it's required by UL that we send out with every operator that goes out the door to these warning signs. They should be installed on both the public and secure side of the gate. And we train our installers to make sure those are installed and we take a picture and uh, have the end user sign off that those are there. Um, and what they do uh, when they leave is up to them, certainly. But, uh, you know, if our installers go back to that site and see that they're off, they'll typically warn them and say, hey, you, got, you guys need to get sign back on them. So anytime you automate a vehicular access point, it is required to have a separate pedestrian access. We don't want people walking through the vehicle access point. We want to have a very obvious way for pedestrians to get in and out of the facility without going through the vehicle access point. So hopefully this is obvious not to do this. Um, this is actually a daycare center, believe it or not. Um, they've actually installed the pedestrian door, the man door in the gate system. Uh, and there's also access control right next to there. So you can walk through the gate and uh, uh, operate the gate at the same time. So don't do that. A good example of pedestrian uh, access points installed correctly. There's really no uh, stipulation as to how far away from the vehicle access point this needs to be. So you can see this one's right next to it. And they did a good thing and put a sign here that tells people where they need to walk. So when it comes to access control, we're talking about access control that requires uh, a gooseneck, let's say a card key, keypad, that kind of thing, something that needs to be installed on site. Uh, of course, it's uh, everything to do with remote um, you know, access or uh, RFID or vehicle identification. But uh, anytime you're putting a, a card key system or a keypad system in, it needs to be no closer than six feet from the gate panel, 360 degrees around the gate. We basically don't want people uh, reaching through here uh, on the gate. Um, so we're gonna make sure that uh, you know, that uh, is brought down to two and four inches so people can't reach through and, and automate the gate system. So you can see here, uh, this is access control uh, installed properly. Um, so this one is certainly correct and this one is definitely too close. So you wanna make sure you're no closer than six feet from the gate panel. The barrier arms are not part of the standard uh, unless the barrier arm is moving within 16 inches of a fixed object. So that could be a bollard, fence line, basically anything that that gate, uh, that that gate arm is moving close to. Uh, if it's moving within 16 inches of that object, it's then required to provide a photo eye directly under the, the barrier arm. If it's out in the open and it's not near a fixed object, then it's free and clear. So essentially, if you do need to put a photo eye under the gate arm, that's how you do it. You want to put it directly under the arm across the entire lane. Um, I recommend people do this on, on most barrier arms, uh, regardless, because it's just a good idea. Uh, but again, if it's out in the open, it's not required. Uh, you see in this uh, particular graphic, um, you have vehicle obstruction loops in the ground. Now, loops are for vehicles, whereas what we're talking about are safety uh, precautions for people. So loops do not uh, factor into this standard. So it's not part of the, of the UL-325 standard. However, loops are very important. Uh, if you don't have loops, uh, vehicle detection loops, you are gonna hit cars with your gate, right? So it's very important to have them in here. Uh, this could be an entire hour long presentation on loops alone, but if you're not familiar with loops, Basically what they are, uh, is, uh, typically it's a saw cut in the pavement. 
They're going to stuff loop wire into that socket. They're going to uh, seal over the top of that. Off the corner of the loop, they're going to run conduit up into the operator. Those leads will terminate on a loop detector. It's in the control board inside the operator. This loop's creating an electromagnetic field 360 degrees around the wire. So you have a uh, signal coming up off of grade and horizontally as well. Typical loop is around six by eight in dimension for a 12 foot lane. Uh, so that's gonna give you about a four foot signal off of grade. So, um, you know, however, if you're specified a barrier arm, um, which closes faster than three seconds, you, you wanna probably propose one that's got a, a good rubber bumper on the bottom so it's not uh, doing too much damage in whatever city. So let's jump into ASTM F2200. It, it's all about the construction and installation of the gate and the hardware, uh, such that you're not creating pinch points, hazards, or entrapment zones, right? So the standard was established back in 01. It basically dovetails with the UL225 standard. Uh, so anytime you automate a vehicular access point, um, ASTM F2200 definitely comes into play. Uh, you'll find most manufacturers will build the gate in compliance with the standard, but uh, in many cases, you know, customization is going to be required out in the field. So, for example, this is a cross section of a, a slide gate, slide gate operator, gate, and then the fence line. And so, again, we're talking about this gap here. Um, so, you want to make sure that um, this gap is brought down to two and a quarter inches. I mentioned that before. Uh, if this gap here between the gate and the fence line is uh, within 16 inches, but greater than two and a quarter, that's considered an entrapment. So you either provide some kind of shielding in here to bring that gap down, or you could provide a wired, hardwired gate edge. So in these examples here, you can see the gap uh, without filler was, was five inches. They brought this down to one and a quarter. This one's already at two and a quarter, so that's compliant. And then the rest of these, you can see what they did to, to bring those down. So a pretty obvious example here, uh, the gap on the left uh, is likely two and a quarter inches, where the one on the right is definitely out of compliance. And you can see in this example um, on the left, uh, they left it off. Uh, providing that is within 16 inches, that's going to be required to, to fill that as well. It did put filler here, but uh, failed to put it on that side. So uh, ASTM uh, states that the gate shall not be allowed to fall over more than 45 degrees from the vertical plane. So a typical uh, follower posts are used to, to mitigate this. Uh, a catch bracket like this one uh, is definitely sufficient. You have uh, other options, certainly. Uh, this is your typical installation like right here. That's proper follower protection. Again, I just want to make sure that the gate cannot fall over more than 45 degrees if it becomes detached. In this example, uh, you can see this ground track slide gate can't fall over more than a few inches. Uh, four vertical follower posts protect uh, anyone standing in the shadow of the gate through its entire operating cycle. Again, on swing gates, um, you know, if this when the gate is a fully open position, if the measurement or the gap between the uh, the gate and the fence line is within 16 inches, it's going to be required to provide a photo eye there. If it's over 16 inches, it's free and clear. Nothing required other than the photo eye across the lane that we talked about. It's always a good idea to put an edge on the uh, on the end of a swing gate as well. Uh, when it comes to edges for swing gates, uh, these are going to be a rounded edge, so it's going to activate in multiple directions. Of course, a swing gate is sweeping. One of the slide gate is a little bit in one direction. So it's a very specific uh, gate edge for a swing gate. So we talk about uh, reach through on the gate. Uh, we want to make sure that we're protecting that, mitigating any uh, potential where somebody can get their arms through the gate. 
so what's required by ASTM is that the gate is brought, uh, any gaps in the gate are brought down to two and quarter inches from grade up to six feet on the gate panel. Above six feet, free and clear. Um, typical picket style gate like this would come four inches on center. So that's fine. Anything above six feet is fine. Below six feet, you want to make sure you're bringing those gaps down to two and a quarter inches. And that's going to include the back frame as well. The old standard was four feet, whereas the new standard is six feet now. And again, you want to make sure you're covering the back frame. You can see in this particular example, uh, they've left that out. Um, they're just trying to reduce weight and, and cost and material and that kind of thing. So you definitely want to make sure that you're specifying that this is uh, covered with the entire gate panel. So not only the gate panel, but also the fence line that the gate slides along needs to be covered as well, up to six feet. So here's uh, an example here of a couple of things that are wrong. Um, Certainly, there's no signage. Uh, the gaps here are too wide. It should be brought down to two and four inches. It's hard to tell whether the access control may be a little too close. Um, I believe they have edges on here, so they're good there. And then on this example, pretty obvious that the access control is too close. That needs to be no closer than six feet. And then you've got the gaps here. Uh, what I'd probably do here is put a hardwired edge on this one, and then I'd fill the material in here to bring that gap down to two and a quarter inches. So uh, by way of definition, I wanna make sure we talk about the types of gates. Uh, so often when it comes to slide gates, we're working with cantilevers. Uh, there's also the ground track, otherwise known as V-track or rolling gate. Uh, what's shown here is a type one cantilever. Uh, typically, you're going to see those utilized with uh, chain link style gates. Um, so what you have here uh, being cantilever, meaning it's it's cantilevering or hovering across the lane, being held up by the tail here of these four wheels. Right? So this is a type one cantilever. There's also a type two that's going to do the same thing. It's going to hover across the lane, but it's going to be held by a C channel up top, kind of like a closet door would. The other type we often run into is a V-track or a rolling gate or a ground track. Uh, people have different words for it. Uh, V-track is pretty typical. Um, and so what this is typically utilized for is, um, you know, gates under, you know, 30 feet. Um, when we talk about cantilever gates, you're going to be limited uh, up to 30 feet. So you get anything past 30 feet, um, you're going to want to probably use, utilize a V-track style gate panel. So what's going on here is you've got a um, basically an upside down angle iron as the track set into a concrete path here, and then the uh, v, v style or V shaped wheel riding on top of the track. Well, a couple of things about that style of a gate: um, it can be um, kind of a maintenance issue when it comes to debris and rocks and that kind of thing. And the uh, track can also kind of come up uh, over time with large trucks and that kind of thing running over it. So. I often recommend going with a cantilever style gate if you can, but again, if you're going getting anything over 30 feet, you're probably going to have to resort to a V-track. We've uh, done some uh, installations where we've had uh, what's called a box frame V-track because it was like 100 feet long, the gate, and so they had actually two tracks in the ground, and it was a box frame gate. HDM also calls out that the gate cannot move under its own gravity. It becomes detached from the gate operator. So you don't want a gate uh, rolling down a parking lot, hit somebody or hit someone's porch or something. Um, so a couple of things you can do here, not a lot of great options. Uh, certainly you could regrade the, the site and get it level. Um, you could also utilize a, uh, a cantilever style gate. Of course, it's got to go the right direction, but uh, and it would be in a level position. So it would come up over the, the fence line uh, in one direction, a little unsightly. So the best option is to try to get it level as you can. So it's also required by ASTM uh, that you cover the, uh, the wheels uh, on, on these cantilever style gates. 
Uh, anything below eight feet is required to be covered. Anything above eight feet is free and clear. Uh, it doesn't need cover. And it also includes uh, the guide rollers, uh, as well as your V-track wheels. So gate protrusions uh, can be a puncture hazard uh, when the gate hits a person in either direction to travel. Uh, so what's not okay? <clears throat> uh, you know, gate hardware such as chain adjustment bolts, that kind of thing. Bottom pickets extend more than half inch below. Uh, the top pickets, uh, which are not aligned with the clean of the gate, um, and uh, and below seven feet from grade. Uh, gate receiver guides. Any non-blunt object attached to the leading or trailing edge of the gate between more than a half inch. So you want to make sure nothing is, is sticking out more than a half inch. And we're concerned with the side and the bottom of the gate panel, um, mostly. Anything sticking out the top uh, has got to be straight in line with the, with the gate. Uh, at seven feet, they can curl over at that point. So some protrusions are allowed, um, such as top pickets, you know, providing there uh, in the vertical plane of the gate, uh, and then bottom pickets, which do not um, go past half inch. And then safety devices like gate edges are certainly okay. So this is a, a pretty common installation error for installing a chain drive operator. So this bracket uh, should be located uh, on the inside of the post. Then the bolt should not extend more than half inch. Uh, and then additionally, that bottom section <clears throat> should be cut back to half inch or you know cut level with that particular horizontal post. So that that definitely is over a half inch right there. So this is a common violation uh, with ASTM F2200. The barbed wire uh, must be installed at six feet or higher from grade, or it is razor wire must be at eight feet or higher from grade to comply with the standard. Let's see the installation uh, on the left meets requirement. The one on the right is likely lower than eight feet for the razor wire. And ASTM requires uh, that you have positive stops on the gate. So you see down here, you've got for this particular, um, you know, rings is like a type two um, positive stops on either end of the gate. And this is just an example of a positive stop for a V track style gate system. So this is another document I'm going to get out to you guys. This is just one page of, of a three-page holdout. Um, so this graphic pretty much covers the entire presentation. Uh, so just looking at this, you can see everything that's required for a slide gate. In this case, uh, you've got your access control out to six feet. You've got your pedestrian door. You've got your photo eyes covering both open and closed direction. Your gate edges covering open and closed direction. Your signage. Your follower posts, you've got your gaps brought down to two and a quarter inches. And covered everything there. And then the same thing is uh, provided for the uh, swing gate. Uh, so one thing to, to note here um, in this particular graphic, it's showing a pad mounted swing gate with the scissor arm. This particular knuckle right here is gonna make it to right about here. So. We talked about that 16 inch zone on swing gates. Um, that knuckle is included, right? So that's probably going to be closer than 16 inches to that wall. So it's required to give a photo eye protecting that zone. All right, folks, that's the end of the UL piece. Um, I'll take the next 10 minutes or so, uh, and we will get through some of the, just at a high level, some of our products, so you guys have an idea of what we offer. Um, so we sell in, into four distinct markets, uh, residential, commercial, industrial, and then HBM, hostile vehicle mitigation, um, you know, otherwise known as crash or anti-ram market. Uh, so our commercial operators, they're 24 volt DC electromechanical, 
Uh, they come standard with UPS battery backup capabilities, and they offer a solar option as well. Um, so these operators are typically considered for projects uh, that want a convenience open versus uh, hardened security at the perimeter, which would be our industrial products. Uh, so typical UBAL class one and two sites, such as HOAs or like commercial environments. Uh, the slice mark DC there, that'll take up to a 15,000 pound gate uh, with a maximum of 40 foot uh, long gate. And the slice mark HD will operate up to a 3,000 pound gate with a maximum length of 50 feet. Whereas the swing smart DC, um, that swing gate will operate a, a 1,300 pound at, uh, at 12 feet, uh, you're out all the way to 20 feet and 600 pound limit. Our industrial operators, these are continuous duty. They're hydraulically driven and they contain uh, fewer moving parts uh, that result in, in greater reliability. We, we tend to measure the lifespan in decades, not years on these. Um, so these things tend to last forever. We have, you know, for instance, our slide driver, we have numerous installations that are over 20 years and still going strong. Um, so you'll find these specified for industrial environments, um, you all class three and class four sites. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, critical infrastructure projects like DOD, Petrochem, substations, fire police, airports, that kind of thing. Critical infrastructure. Slide driver, that offers up to uh, three foot per second for class three uh, and four sites. It will move up to a 20,000 pound gate uh, at one foot per second with the slide driver 200 there. And several of those, uh, the slide over 200s installed on the US Mexican border. The hydro swing, uh, we like to call that the linear actuator on steroids. Uh, it'll operate up to a, a 40 foot uh, gate weighing 15,000 pounds. It can withstand uh, heavy wind loads. And then the swing riser um, is a, kind of a unique animal. It will raise the gate panel straight up uh, four inches, pulling the locking pins out of the ground. And then it'll continue to raise another uh, eight inches for a full one foot rise to get up over curbs or if you have great issues behind the gate, that kind of thing. And it'll take up to about a 3,000 pound gate panel. The strong arm, uh, that can span 36 feet, so it covers multiple lanes all at once, uh, offers a unique breakaway feature. And then the hydro lift, if you can't swing or slide, um, oftentimes you can go straight up. So the hydro lift is often used in that particular scenario. That'll take a 2,000 pound maximum weight gate panel, which is 80 feet max, and it'll raise it 16 feet in the air in about eight seconds. So we also offer a complete line of hostile vehicle mitigation barriers. Uh, these are typically specified for critical infrastructure sites, for sure. Uh, these are definitely class four oriented, although we put them in a number of different locations that are not considered a class four, um, but you know, your typical installation is gonna be you know, DOD, Petrochem, state, federal, local governments, that kind of thing, embassies. Um, so they're engineered, field crash tested uh, to ASTM, IWA, and PASS certification standards. They offer a five-year warranty. Uh, it's common to see something uh, like the slide driver that we just talked about integrated with one of our crash barriers to provide both security and anti-RAM protection as well. The strong arm M30, M50, these, these guys are field crash tested. They come in uh, lengths of 12 to 24 feet. Uh, and they'll stop a 15,000 pound vehicle doing 30 or 50 miles an hour. Um, the installation on these is, is less expensive than the comp competition out there. Uh, we have a unique installation template that makes the installation process um, really quick and, and error free. Um, so it definitely reduces installation cost. Uh, both operators, uh, these are pat. They have a patented dual arm design. You see the bottom arm there. It adds a little additional safety um, by reducing impact by a, a non-threatening vehicle. Uh, and you can also order these in CE certified or uh, and also UPS models. Wedge smart. That's essentially our uh, strong arm park uh, integrated arm with a crash wedge. It's uh, engineer rated to FS30, which means it'll stop a full-size sedan traveling about 30 miles an hour. And it can be ordered in lengths from 9 to 14 feet. And that one comes standard with UPS battery backup.
Hydro Wedge SM50 is available in widths between six and 13, six and a half and 13 feet, actually. Uh, these are field crash tested to ASTM M50, IWA, and PASS international standards uh, with zero vehicle penetration unknown. Um, it offers a high cycle throughput, low open close speed of about three seconds. So we've got an EFO speed of about one second. And then UPS uh, capability is available for that as well as all of these operators have a UPS option that's available to them. Then we have our uh, M30 and M50 engineered field crash tested bollards. Uh, they come in fixed removal or active models uh, with an option for shallow or deep mount foundations. And then our uh, strong slide M30 and M50. Uh, this is field crash tested and offers a, a length of up to 24 feet maximum. And it's driven by our next generation slide driver two, uh, slide uh, SD50F. It's basically a slide driver will take up to a 5,000 pound um, gate panel. Info on this guy is uh, totally customizable. Uh, we offer several options, but uh, you can also provide your own infill for that. Um, and you know, if you're going to install a slide gate anyway, uh, and you need anti ramp protection, you might as well go with something like a strong slide uh, and save yourself some money. Show you guys how we test these out in the field. This is our. Uh, Strong arm M30 crash test. You can see this stick right here is the P1. The P1 mark, which is uh, a meter or 3.3 feet. And they're testing how far the back of the cab enters the secure zone or the secure side. That one got a P1. Check us out on all the social medias out there. Um, if you go to our website, check out the support center. That's going to be your uh, your best location for all the cut sheets and all the information, all the manuals, everything you need to know about the gate operators. Definitely going to be available through there. And certainly contact us if you have uh, any projects you need some help with. Uh, again, we like to work with you in the early design stage. We can work you, with you throughout the entire project, uh, making sure that you you're, get the proper operator uh, specified. We can review your specs and your plans, mark them up, um, and just do just general consultation around the entire project. All right, so uh, just last one here. Uh, this QR code allows you to uh, scan that with your, your cell phone. If you want to do that, you can go ahead and, and uh, that gives you a form you can fill out to get your certificate for this course. Um, I will also be sending out a, um, an email with a link to that form as well. So if you want a certificate, uh, certainly go for that. And uh, we will be certainly um, uploading and registering your, your credits with the AIA as well. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thanks so much, Brad. Um, we do have quite a few questions. Uh, looks like we've got two minutes, so maybe we can get to one or two. Um, and then just want to encourage folks to submit any questions that you might have. We will have a record of them so we can follow up afterwards. Um, all right, let's start off with uh, the first one here. Why can't you have pedestrian doors in, in the gate? Is this a code issue, a safety issue, or both? Both. Both. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, just, uh, just not a good idea. Cool. <laughs> all around <laughs> <that> idea. <laughs> Um, all right. Do you need more than six feet to the controller on a swing out gate? Do you need more? Well, you can certainly go more with your with your access device. Uh, you just can't go any closer. So you can yeah. certainly, you know, and that and that's oftentimes the case. You know, depending on the site and what the situation, what kind of vehicles you're working with, and you know, what sort of timing you need from the time you actually present the card and when the gate starts opening. Cool. All right. Um, how much force can these gates withstand? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. I don't have an answer to right off the bat. Um, I, I'm assuming that question is related to wind loading. Mm. Um, and that just has, a, there's a, a lot of factors there, uh, depending on whether the gate is really closed down uh, or if there's a lot of open space, a lot of wind um, can get through the gate or not uh, as to what kind of uh, force is applied to the gate panel itself. Um, but uh, you know, when it comes to swing gates, uh, the pad mounted swing gate, like you see in this picture, um, you want to make sure you have at least 
50% open space on those panels for that type of a swing gate operator. If you have panels that are uh, heavier and more closed down, essentially a sail in the wind, um, then now it's going to be our hydro swing we talked about earlier, uh, the hydraulic option, uh, which is something I'd recommend for that. Awesome. All right. Looks like we might have time for, oh, all right. It's 2 p.m. So I'm going to hold off there. There are a few more questions. Um, so just a reminder for folks, we'll have a record of those. We'll make sure the high security team gets them so that you can get all your questions answered. Um, but yeah, just want to thank everyone today for coming out and participating in today's webinar. There will be a quick survey after today's event when you leave. So if you have a moment to fill that out, that'd be super helpful for us. Um, and thank you so much to High Security. Thank you, Brad, for presenting today's course. It was super informative, um, really great job. So really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. All right. Hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Yeah.